Disinformation continues to be a threat to Ukrainian sovereignty and unity, though it is perhaps not as effective as it was in the years 2014 to 2022. But around the world, aggressive information warfare still threatens information security and social stability, especially in states which Russia seeks to destabilize or even coerce into supporting it. As we saw in the 2016 US elections, it can also potentially threaten the results of voting. It can place undue influence on voters' decisions and undermine democratic processes. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. Please like and subscribe if you like the content we produce. It will really help these videos do better in YouTube's algorithm if you do. Valeria Kavtun is Head at Filter, the national media literacy project founded in Ukraine. Filter aims to make society more resilient to misinformation and is a crucial tool in Ukraine's armory to defend itself from aggressive Russian information warfare. Valeria was formerly a journalist at BBC Real, a senior correspondent at major Ukrainian media organizations and a fellow journalist at the United Nations. She has also a background in video production, content management and news broadcasting. Valeria Kavtun has studied at law, media, communications and journalism at several prestigious institutions, including the Kiev National Economics University, the Taras Shevchenko National University of Kiev and the London School of Economics. Uh, Valeria, welcome back to the channel, because this, of course, is our second opportunity to talk about your project. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Well, it was a couple of months since we spoke. The channel had only just got going. And of course, a lot has happened since. Obviously, in the war in Ukraine, the tide has turned, we hope, uh, and reached a number of tipping points as Russia's retreated. But also your project has grown, hasn't it? The scale and impact of your project. So could you describe a little bit of, of what's been happening over the last few months? Yeah, there have been some changes, um, some some changes in, in our work as filter project, as well as in general, in, in how this war is ongoing. So um, we do try to get back on track and we try to be this national project we claim to be therefore to interact with all Ukrainians from all around the country. So we celebrated the Global Media Literacy Week recently, which sounds a bit, um, if not weird, but quite, I'd say, unusual for the war context, celebrating, right? But at the same time, I guess that's what all Ukrainians are doing these days, celebrating life, because I, I feel um, lots of people realize that it's actually worth it. Everything they've done is worth uh, worth it because they know what they're suffering for. Interestingly, recently, a filter made a, made a post uh, with data. Um, we, we try to kind of communicate data frequently so that uh, we promote uh, reading statistics as one of the um, elements of being a media literate person. So uh, interestingly, that 68% of Ukrainians consider themselves happy. Uh, whereas in 2021, 71% claimed that they were happy, which means that despite the war, it hasn't particularly changed uh, only by 3%, which is nothing. So despite the war, Ukrainians feel happy and that's, that's a great result. So I think we need to keep working and that's what we've been doing. We launched a couple of initiatives. We work with uh, displaced Ukrainians. We work with uh, um, Ukrainians from all regions. We launched the National Media Literacy Test to see how many Ukrainians are resilient. Of course, it's not um, showing us the full picture, but still it's some steps in this time. So we hope uh, we'll keep doing it and hopefully we'll be able to get back to normal life and rebuild Ukraine also through making people more, crit more, more, more critical and more media literate. That's tremendous. I mean, that's a huge amount of positive uh, impact over the last few months. And that's an extraordinary statistic to, uh, you know, understand, despite the hardships, that, that people still feel that level of positivity. And I've noted as well, with many of your excellent posts on LinkedIn and Twitter, which I do advise our audience to follow, um, you've had some very high profile coverage, haven't you, on national TV and, of course, in the Western press as well. Yeah, that's fantastic as well, because uh, I think the sense of unity is is just it plays well for us now. Um, before, it was a challenge to kind of 
coordinate all the efforts, unite all the NGOs and all the companies and media organizations to work for one goal. These days, you don't have to um, to take any extra effort to do that. They are willing to uh, jump in the initiative to help us promote it. And I was I also wrote a post saying that um, ahead of the Global Media Literacy Week, we had a couple of coordination meetings with the, our partners and friends and so, I mean, NGOs and media companies. And interestingly that I remember um, at that time, it was just right, right after the rocket attacks all around Ukraine. Uh, it was after 10th of October where when Russia attacked Kiev and lots of people kind of didn't have um, a connection. They didn't have data. There were more frequent electricity disruptions. But despite that, they joined. Sometimes the connection wasn't the best, but it meant that people actually um, did something to, to make it happen. They, they managed to join the call to brainstorm on how we can present this test. Initially, we wanted to position it as an exam, and some of the partners suggested to make it less complicated. So we were discussing all that, and I was feeling extremely inspired by, by this sense of unity, something which we could only dream about a year ago is suddenly our reality. And interestingly that the national TV marathon, TV United, which is like the only TV channel basically now in Ukraine, which covers all the country, uh, they volunteered to talk about it, to announce it live. They did it a couple of times. Uh, and I was talking not only about the test itself, we had some airtime for me explaining to people what are the key Russian propaganda narratives and tactics and how to verify information. So we actually shared something which they could use in daily life. This is great. And I was super happy that this was happening. And interestingly, that after these uh, live stream we had like our website down because suddenly thousands, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians started going to our website to check the materials which I was mentioning. And that's great. I'm, 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 I was feeling really thankful to the media organizations for, for helping us spread a word. And I think it contributed to such a great activity during the test. And I was going to ask you, because I think it's an interesting process, which uh, not that many people outside Ukraine are really aware of, but I know that some propagandists have you know turned this into a negative when it ne not necessarily isn't but the many uh tv outlets the many organizations um and channels they've been united haven't they into a into a sort of single body to try and coordinate messages and try and coordinate response and to fight disinformation did that make it much easier for you dealing with a a single network rather than multiple tv networks um for sure it does but it's not necessarily a great thing um apart from this national tv channel we also talked with regional media so we were covered by a number of regional media outlets and also they did live interviews with filter um where we also explained uh, details about the test but also how to to improve your media literacy which, I mean, and then these regional media, they have a, a higher level of trust very often in, in this particular uh, uh, community rather than the national TV. Of course, it makes easier to have just one channel and it's definitely, uh, it means that it covers more people. But I, yeah, I heard this criticism as well. Uh, it's it's okay to have this discussion and, and until this discussion is healthy it's it's totally fine and i might agree and disagree with certain points i do think that sooner or later it has to change uh because we need a diversity of voices and diversity of opinions and these channels do try to provide it of course you can't be unbiased in the war we still have an enemy and you communicate it knowing that you have one common enemy but I think Ukraine is different from Russia in a way that we question things and we are critical of the government. We, are, we still just remain critical of the president's speeches. People still do this. And that's great. And I think if there is a healthy discussion about the importance or not no importance of this United TV marathon, it's, it's already a great, great sign and it just needs to be solved. And I think it's, it's being solved and people try to find a solution to it. And you've got some great stats, haven't you? Because I believe that over 32,000 Ukrainians have now taken part in the media literacy test. That number might have risen since since I made a note of it. And uh, 17,000 uh, or over 17,000 passed it completely. So that's an incredibly high success rate, isn't it? Uh, you must be proud of that. 
Absolutely. We had fantastic uh, partners who kind of helped us implement it all at uh, IREX. It's, it's a great media literacy organization with a great experience. Um, so I think that's the part of the success. Uh, but also the fact that, um, and we had over 100,000 people who actually went to the platform to see how it looks and if they wanted to pass a test which mm. is also a lot i think but the fact that over 30 percent actually started sorry 30 thousand actually started passing it it speaks a lot um i think it's 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 the fact that ukrainians realize the importance of being a media literate person at the time of war and we keep communicating the fact that if you are media literate and if you know how to resist disinformation you may you, you feel safer and you make sure your family is safe so i think it helps at the same time um it's quite, I mean, people were curious to check that level of media literacy and r and by default, we are all curious to check whether we are, I don't know, emotionally intelligent. There are so many tests like that. So I think when you hear uh, in the news that do you want to check if you can resist disinformation and detect it quickly, if you know which Telegram channel it, it belongs to a propaganda, uh, you know, like a rupor of Kremlin, then you're kind of curious, you want to know. So and we had this kind of questions where the, where we asked something which actually happened in real life and where we used real cases. So I think that brought a lot of interest to the test as well. And it makes it more real, doesn't it? And I think that... Um... That should probably be my next question, because last time we talked about, you know, the test in theory and your organization and the challenges of rolling it out. I'd love to hear a little bit more about the specific um, propaganda narratives that you're tackling and how the test is able to capture those and get people to really focus and think critically about them. So we had a couple of sections so that each section could check some media literacy skill. There were some basic concepts so that if people know what is uh, psychops, psychological operations, if they know what this term means and what, what it, it is, in fact, we were checking whether they know how social media, the social network algorithms work, whether they know um, what they should and shouldn't like um, and how it affects them. And we had actually some real cases where we um, posted a picture a photo of a wedding with a with the Ukrainian of a wedding of a Ukrainian soldier and a Ukrainian woman, and the capture the caption was saying, um, "Leave a like to this lovely couple. Isn't it great that they celebrate life despite the war?" And then we had we had a range of questions like, "What would you do with this post? How would you react?" and a set of options, and then it kind of tested if if people who left the like just to kind of support the couple, they kind of subscribed un, uh, unintentionally to a group on on Facebook uh, who who then potentially could show them some manipulative content. And we were checking that. And quite a, quite a lot of Ukrainians were aware of this trick. But at the same time, I, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, over 30% still uh, chose a wrong answer. Um, we have some a section checking uh, their understanding of the uh, news production processes and cr how to you know check if, it, if the source is credible, uh, fact checking skills and a section number five was about um, the ability to save personal data and to use resources so there were different questions uh, most of them were um, about telegram about facebook because i think these are most popular platform um, for ukrainians um, and interestingly that it turned out that this test was kind of interesting for both these school children we had a um, a big amount of actually uh, high school students participating in the test. But at the same time, for someone over 40 years old, it, it had also the, the, a part of those percentage of um, uh, audience over 40 um, uh, was uh, very, very big. So um, it means that we covered uh, all age groups and, and that's great. Um, and yeah, Ukrainians are quite, I'd say, middle literate, but at the same time, there is a lot of space for growth. Um, I, I can share more detailed statistics, but I, I don't want to overload you with numbers. <laughs> and that's important, that growth, isn't it? Because Ukraine is at the forefront or has been at the forefront for more than eight years of this, um, you know, psychological media manipulation and aggression. Um, in some ways, you're exposed to more of it. Um and it's more pernicious because, of course, Russian for many is a second language and for some it's a, a primary language on the territory of Ukraine. And that makes it so much easier, doesn't it, for Russian narratives to percolate. It's true. Uh, but interestingly, uh, Russian disinformation in Ukraine 
so different from from disinformation in 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 Western Europe, I'd say. Firstly, because for Ukraine, it's super obvious who's the enemy. I think these narratives about I don't know, like before Russia was trying to promote in mass culture, it's it's phenomenal. We we are now writing so many materials about Russian TV series in early 2000. And Ukrainians are like, oh my God, it is so obvious that Russia was promoting their narratives, their ideology through this TV series, portraying Ukrainians as barbaric, uncivilized, unintelligent people all the time. And we didn't see it. Suddenly everyone is like, this is so obvious. So I don't think the same tactic promoting Russian narratives through mass culture works but what works actually is uh, sowing disbelief in the Ukrainian government uh, kind of fueling conflicts inside of the Ukrainian society trying to divert attention from more urgent problems I think this is where Ukrainians have to be super careful because you don't really need to um, to kind of think a lot about if Russia is actually an enemy. You just look out of the window and you see Russian Russian rockets and you hear about Russian rockets every day. I'm still following all my local uh, vibrant telegram channels and it, like they have up to 15 notifications daily saying that Russia launched rockets and that people have to go to shelters. So this is like something which no one actually questions. But what you have, what they have to be careful with is this emotional, um, uh, powerful impact and interestingly that there are so many fake stories about dead Ukrainian soldiers where you could see posts saying like this war is taking the best people the best people are dying and if you see this continuously in your feed you get depressed you get more aggressive I'm not saying that all, all of these posts are fake but Russia contributes to promoting this hysteria a lot promoting this anger and and depression so we have to be extremely careful with what we are seeing and that's that's another challenge yeah. and of course the the brutality is inflicted across the country but it's especially sharp isn't it in those areas which traditionally um had a higher percentage of of russian speakers so whereas perhaps prior to 2014 there might have been more sympathy for the russian cultural world at least um uh, now i think it's apparent to everybody whether russian is their primary language or not that all they get from from russia is indifference aggression and so on and i think they're also seeing how russians treat their own army treat their own soldiers with abuse murder torture and and just a complete lack of humane values as well as incompetence and inefficiency and all these other things that we've seen yeah, we have to we have to learn more about Russia as well. Um, unfortunately, we have to know the enemy. Um, yeah, I, I do believe that the level of aggression within the Russian society is quite high, and they have very little level of tolerance to each other. And it's like tones of interceptions are kind of illustrating this. Um, and in in the the liberated and liberated areas, right? And the, in in Kherson, we have we are now we are like extremely happy, and we are celebrating this little victories. I'm I'm not saying probably not right to say literal. They're actually quite big victory, but there is so much work to do. There is so much work ahead to to kind of make sure these people get back into the Ukrainian information space, um, because you know. We we we, ha we we don't really know what's happening inside of these people, what's happening in their minds, and how we can work with that. We know they support Ukraine, and we are super grateful for that. But there's there must be we need so much more research about, you know, like what they experience, what their fears are, and how can we work with them so that we don't harm. And I think for sociology there is a, a huge field of work um and then yeah we'll have to catch up with with that a lot but at the same time there is a sense of i don't know a sense of support uh, a sense of unity and that's great but i'm just super afraid that we need to preserve it and and sooner or later it, it can't last forever so something must be done now to make sure it, it's still we still keep this spirit and we protect our society from from russian influence where they kind of tr still try to divide people and to play with this emotion yeah and that process of creating a ukrainian information space a more pluralistic space it's going to be even more challenging isn't it i mean in kherson people have directly experienced occupation and they're probably not going to be uh 
you know, very sensitive to uh, or, or open to 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 Russian propaganda narratives. But in Crimea and the Donbass, that's even more challenging because they've been within the Russian informational space for a long time and they've lacked any kind of uh, plurality of information sources. I mean, what do you see as the role of filter when those territories I say when, you know, let's assume they are taken back. Um, what role is Filter going to play in 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 helping to, um, I guess, de-radicalize the population there? I love this rhetoric that we already speak of it as a potential future. And that's already great. I think that's, that's great that the world is moving to this type of conversations. Um, yeah, definitely building, uh, helping to build healthy dialects is, is a great, uh, is our role. Um, being able to have um, well built dialogues with each other, to criticize without being aggressive, to find the right arguments and to support your your thoughts with the right arguments. I think that's the role we should play. And um, I think definitely um, before launching something, we need to understand what actually people want and what would work for them. Definitely working with the local media. I think that's, that's one of the first steps to do because local media are there. They know the context. They know what their audiences might like. They know what are the audiences paying. So helping local media uh, grow and um, adhere to the journalism standards, um, report in a balanced way and give voices to people. That's something which which could really be the first step. And then, of course, working directly with people on the ground, um, making sure they, they have their local influencers in some way through who we can promote our messages, those local influencers who can kind of... Um, uh, unite people around around them and around the topic. And thirdly, I believe it's important to also bring people back because on these liber deliberated areas uh, and in Donbass and Crimea, lots of people fled, uh, had fled, and now they they are coming back and they, they will be hopefully coming back, but they, they need to be reintegrated as well because there are still some, there might be some you know, like resentment between those who stayed and those who fled, and I'm seeing it already now. So again, building this dialogue, making sure they they communicate if they if they're not happy with something, and basic education. You know, just educating people on history, on on you know, like making sure they read news correctly. All this has to be in complex, and I think that's where we as Filter Project can play a role. I think your role, your impact uh, doesn't just go, you know, it goes beyond the individual and their ability to interpret the media and ask questions. Without that, you know, we see this in the US, we see it in the UK around Brexit, in the US around MAGA. We see a tendency for people to uh, go very tribal and without media literacy, they can fall back into a fairly extreme or cult like way of thinking. Um and that divides families from each other, generations from each other. And I think that's going to be especially important, isn't it, in Ukraine, is to have that open dialogue so that you don't have a schism between, you know, the same families having totally different uh, worldviews, in fact. I think that's definitely something we should learn from, from the UK. I believe you have this great uh, skill. It's it's something which I observe as a as a, as a foreigner. Let me say so. I've been living here for quite a while, so I really enjoy the way like the the BBC, you know, promotes healthy dialects. How they it's not perfect. I know it's not, but still the way you manage to voice your opinions without um, being rude, uh, with, with using the right words, not to harm people and not to sound too emotional, but still delivering your main, the, the points. So I think that's, that's something where we can maybe exchange experiences and it would be great actually to learn from other countries because I think Ukraine is, is a super young democracy and it needs um, a bit of, um, you know, help. Uh, and very often, uh, and, there's, and then, of course, it's really in relation to the war, I'm speaking about this emotional way of, you know, delivering your idea. So people are still not good at, um, at um, yeah, building this dialects, which you mentioned. So there's a lot of work, but also there is a lot of understanding in the society that we need it. And I think if there is a wish, there is a way. Yeah.
And do you think uh, in combination with media literacy, that's just one part of probably a multi, multi-pronged multi uh, um, sort of structure, isn't it, or approach? Do you think other disciplines will help to make people more resilient? So, for instance, a deeper reading of history, a more awareness of history can, can really support the work you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just a um, few weeks ago, I went to a presentation of a book, um, Social Media and Hate, and the author was telling about an interesting, it's not really a revelation, it's something we all kind of know, but at the same time, we never thought about it. So she was saying that, in fact, those people who promote misinformation on social media are those who are media literate. Like they know all the tools, they know how algorithms and social media work, they know how to frame their messages so that they can impact people. So they are in a way media literate. So how do we make sure when, when we are promoting media literacy, when we are teaching media literacy, how do we make sure that we are actually not contributing you know, to potential uh, spreaders of misinformation? And she said an interesting idea that it's not just about us teaching people how to use uh, the instruments and, and the recent technology to promote their messages and to verify information and to create information. It's more about providing them with a diversity of contexts, with teaching them history, with teaching them languages, culture, uh, literature, so that people grow up as uh, well-educated, intelligent personalities who then understand the, the, the harms and the benefits of being a digital literate person. So I believe, and that's we, we are, that is why Filter also has changed its approach a bit in the last couple of months. So in our social media, we try to not only talk about how to verify information and potential, you know, like which instruments to use and which are the tactics of propaganda. We talk a lot about literature as well, about history, but we not only speak about it, we do a lot of research before creating super short informative posts. We do a lot of reading. We consult with historians. Um, we we do like consult with international experts. And I think that's what audience appreciates as well. Because media literacy, as we discussed last time, it's quite awkward people don't really want to learn about media literacy but if you present them something uh, which kind of broadens their horizons and it's kind of then they're happy to read it and, and share it as well well that's a fascinating uh, point you made there um about consumption of media because i've always thought about media literacy as being something about almost like a passive consumption and changing the way you consume media but actually is your course also going to tackle you know, how people generate content, because I guess that's a big part of the problem. Yeah, I mean, the literacy is, is not just about consumption. It's a lot about generating because we live in the time of co-producers. I don't know, people who co-create content. So we all are participants of the of this whole huge information space and people do create and share content. So actually preparing a course now now online a video course uh, with five modules and the fifth module is about how to create and share content responsibly where we have an expert who has been leading um, a platform called we are ukraine and um, she's sharing her insights on how to make sure people trust you how to verify information and how to actually talk to people who who are succumbing to propaganda how to make sure you deliver your message right to them but that you're not falling into emotions so I think that's an essential part. And we started adding this uh, section to all our, like depending on who we work with, but we always try to promote the idea that it's not only about being a passive consumer, it's a lot about co-producing content because there are so many people who share photos in the war zone and then journalists use it. So it would be great if these people knew how to take pictures, how to make sure they are verified, how to frame your message when you're describing a photo and how to make sure you are not um, you are not using your judgments when you are describing it, but rather facts. So all this is quite important and it's, it's, in a, it's another important uh, part of media literacy as well. And one thing I really wanted to uh, to, to really ask you on, because I saw you um, wrote a, a fantastic uh, piece or were involved in the creation of a piece for The Independent on the role of humour, uh, both in propaganda, but also counter propaganda. And I think one of the big features uh, of this war uh, and one thing that's really raised uh, people's perception of uh, Ukraine has 
ironically, you know, been the production of memes, uh, of humorous, uh, you know, humorous items, um, possibly one of the most powerful weapons in the information war. And of course, as someone who's entirely subjective, I look at a lot of memes generated by propagandists and don't find them at all funny. A lot of them tend to be kind of crude and they're based on cliches and assumptions that because they don't ring true, don't work for me at least. And all the best memes seem to be on the Ukrainian side. But I'd love to hear about your view of humour, both as a weapon, but also how you incorporate that into, into your course. Yeah, we actually do speak a lot about that because um, I I find it personally I think it's it's super important to deliver to the world that Ukrainians don't lose hope and they keep fighting and they are quite happy despite everything. Um, it's Christmas time. People are just people don't really want. I mean, whether whether we want to acknowledge it or not, but in fact, people really aspire for something better. It's the Christmas time. I see it like happening all around in London and in the EU. Everyone's preparing for the great celebration and they're like already thinking about their holidays or, or maybe not maybe for sure some of them planned it already. So when we talk about the war, unfortunately, people tend to kind of protect themselves from negative emotions. So I think the victories which we had in, in last few months uh, it's, a, it's a great a way to communicate Ukraine and our needs. And also, I think that Ukrainians need to show more of stamina, more of uh, optimism, and, and, and humor is a great way for that. Uh, firstly, for the world is great because people associate Ukraine with something positive, not just suffering. And secondly, I believe it's also great for Ukrainians themselves, because if you say... For instance, my parents, they are in the north north of Ukraine. They are deprived of basic comfort. Every single day, they do not have electricity uh, five times per day. Every two hours, it's off. So they have to adapt. That they, basically, all their life now depends on those two hours of having electricity. And when they go to work, they just wait until the electricity is there. And then they quickly work while they still have this possibility. But despite that, uh, when I'm talking to them, they're like, whatever it's okay we're gonna we're gonna manage because there is nothing else to do it's so much better than being under russian occupation anyway and they're making jokes like about the neighboring house who has the light and they don't and they're like oh god please please i'm not asking for the light for myself just deprive them of this electricity as well because it's just unfair and it just makes um this like gives a bit of happiness to everything and also it's it's a great way to promote ukraine i believe and and, and then yeah, it just works, I think, good for both both in both parties. And information management has been incredibly effective on the Ukrainian side, hasn't it? Because, I mean, this may reflect the truth on the ground to some extent, but there's going to be terrible things happening on the ground. But when we look at the information space, we see Ukrainian soldiers being resilient. We see them dancing. We see extraordinary kind of songs and optimism. Um Generally, when we see them on manoeuvres, I mean, this may reflect reality. They seem very ordered uh, with very crisp uniforms um, on vehicles that, that that look in sort of good repair. Uh, and, you know, and and it just conveys this impression of discipline, order, strategy, strength of humour. When we compare this to the I would almost call it the unordered information space, because we're getting a lot of videos out. From the Russian side, but it tends to be from individual soldiers, which they're recording illegally, individually, and they're sort of leaking out. Um, we get the complete opposite impression of uh, disorganization, uh, people even betraying each other, running away, fleeing. We see a litany of incompetence and general, you know, uniforms in a, in a terrible state, trenches in a terrible state. And this might reflect reality, but I kind of suspect there's quite a bit of manipulation of the information space as well to create these impressions. Yeah, but it's also hard to to kind of fake your emotions. If you are, you feel like dancing, you dance and you record it. If you feel like, uh, but there are so many videos with Ukrainian soldiers holding kittens or dogs in the, you know, in the war area. And it's just like, it, it talks a lot about them remaining human despite everything. 
Whereas in Russia, unfortunately, as I said, I feel there is a very, very high level of aggression towards each other. And they don't have really a goal in this war. They understand they don't fight for anything. They are stealing someone's territory. They come to rob and they, they come to kill. And they know that. And it's, of course, humiliating for them, I believe. So what kind of content can you create for them? And no matter how hard you try to position yourself as a positive country who who's a great, mighty Russia, it, it doesn't. it's not going to work. People are not going to... Um, Gen be genuine because they don't really feel like that so i think that that plays a role and definitely it's it's used as an instrument i'm saying humor is used as an instrument there are so many twitter accounts who who promote ukraine in a great way kind of like always using this jokes also the ukrainian governmental institutions are not shying away from uh from humor as well we 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 saw a couple of not couple quite many actually tweets from the ministry of defense mm -hmm. declaring their love for macron in a very <laughs> creative way uh and i think generally building uh, positivity despite the war it helps to kind of build also um, a, a positive uh, attachment to ukraine and and we are actually indeed we we are super grateful for everything what the western world does i'm, I'm saying western but in fact i kind of it's not good to kind of div divide ukraine from the western world let me say our allies do for us and I think it's also important to always express this gratitude because what you mentioned in a, in a way is also due to the support from, from the EU, from the UK, from the US, and then all these uniforms, all this like the, the, their way of their strategies, which they have. It's thanks to the fact that Ukrainians were trained, thanks to the fact that they, they have the ammunition from the West. And, and this is constant support, which, which we are thankful for and which which we need and we will need but will this support we can do great things so equipment morale and training and that does come together and i think you can't fake uh the sort of many of the videos that we're seeing i mean it, it, it's it's conveying the strengths of those values i mean my last uh sort of main question i think is your program has been incredibly successful and it's clearly absolutely the right timing for filter and the work you've been doing have you had interest from Western governments and institutions to try and create similar programs of work? And are you aware of any similar programs in the West? Uh, yeah, there are separate institutions in the West, which we look up to uh, in Finland, for instance, in uh, I talked to some UK organizations, um, you have extremely powerful civil society as well. Um, but it's definitely a huge challenge for every you, every country to kind of have a coordination body institution that will unite all the efforts. And I think there is a lot to learn for us as filter from other countries, as well as from us uh, as Ukrainian project in terms of providing quick solutions and uh, adaptability. So I think that would be great to kind of launch this range of dialogues or conversations where we can be useful to each other. Uh, and then hopefully maybe they'll be interested in learning something from Filter, at, at least how to work in extreme conditions and how to change a strategy drastically depending on the situation on the ground. And we, we need a lot of support in terms of policy making and planning our life after the war. And that's what we've been already discussing with, with the UK institutions, Ofcom in particular, I believe you have a great expertise in that. And that's something which we'd be happy to, to learn. And of course, you've got some great learnings, haven't you? You know, in the way you incentivize people to take the tests, the way you've structured the tests, and of course, the fantastic media coverage you've got uh, through the sort of unified um, uh, TV network that exists during the war. I mean, hopefully some of those lessons can be, can be passed on. Um, I think the UK definitely needs media resilience, but there are other countries. I mean, uh, I dare not dare not pick them all out, but I know we could include Serbia, Italy, Hungary. There are many countries that perhaps would benefit from a little more, um, let's say, objective broadcasting and empowering people with the skills to think critically about media sources. There must be a political will for it, because if if there is this challenge, I think it's it's definitely hard. I think Filter was blessed with this great support from the very beginning, uh, from the ministry, from the government, parliamentarians, from the, you know, like, we actually had a few uh, 
uh, activities with the president's office. So I think that's a great ground for us. And we've been developing so quickly thanks to the support. So if this is missing, I think it's a very important element in, in building this type of institution. But at the same time, who knows, maybe, maybe, maybe we can try and, and something will work out. And I think the work you're doing, extraordinary work you're doing, is going to remain important because even when Ukraine wins, and you know, I've I've believed all the way through that that is uh, both possible and the likely outcome. Um, but even when that happens, and and Russia creeps back to the territory uh, it controlled uh, before 2014, nonetheless, the threat from the media environment, the threat from the Russian information sphere. That may well continue. We we have no idea what is going to happen there. Um, it seems unlikely, however, that they will entirely change uh, the structure of state TV or its malign intent. So it seems to me the work you're doing will remain incredibly important for Ukraine's sovereignty in the future. Yeah, and this this is very heartwarming to to kind of realize that my work and my team's work has an impact and i'm glad that we help people in this war and i hope that it will be a part of reconstruction plan and this media literacy and generally literacy in general must be included in this plan and we'll do everything uh, what we can to make it happen and be there well, it's extraordinary work you're doing, Valeria, and I want to thank you so much for uh, spending time again to uh, help educate the channel. I think last time we had lots of positive comments saying you were the most compelling speaker that we'd covered. So hopefully I look forward to uh, seeing more of the same. Oh, you do have so many great speakers, so <laughs> that's quite flattering, though. <laughs> no, it's definitely true, though. I think uh, people are really engaged with this topic. And so it's great to speak with you again. And uh, I have to say, um, Slava Ukraini. Hello, I'm Slava. Well said. <laughs> no accent. <laughs> <laughs>